In today's video, I'm going to be explaining how to choose the right pawn break while playing the King's Indian. Plus, I'm also going to show how to absolutely demolish the London system in only 10 moves. To better understand how important this topic really is, imagine you get invited to a wedding, but you show up wearing a tank top and shorts. Or let's take the less likely scenario. You got a date with your crush. Of course, you're very excited about it. You're telling your family, your friends, but on the final day, just because you want to go extra comfy, you decide to go on with the good old uh, sandals and socks. Don't get me wrong. If you're a big player, you may still pull this off, but you're making things unnecessarily difficult. The same in chess when you are going for the wrong pawn break. Take a quick look on the position on the board. Black has a choice between e5 or c5. But one of these moves, it's actually completely losing. And the funniest thing is that most players don't even pay attention to the pawn break. Almost similar to when you ask somebody what is their name and you forget to actually listen to the name. And you're like, what the heck was that? So for that, I'm going to be walking you through three games. First two, dedicated to the pawn break. And the last game will be dedicated to the London system. Let's get started. All right, boys and girls. Finally, managed to get another game against d4. Gonna be playing uh, knight f6, and we're gonna be playing the king's Indian. So, opponent goes for the typical c4, pretty much the queen's gambit, and uh, I am just gonna complete my Tiankero, and it is gonna be up to him whether he plays with e4 uh, or not, because he has the choice to do with or without e4. And uh, there we have it on the board. Um, sometimes e5 can be quite scary. Not immediately, like castling is fine. Um, and uh, then playing d6 works, but I just like to play d6 right away. Doing d6 and then castling. Now, my opponent uh, can choose from a variety of moves, but he plays bishop to g5 right away, which is not very common, I have to say. Most popular moves uh, would be knight f3, pawn to f3, the zemish, uh, or bishop e2, let's say, with bishop e3 maybe. Those are very common and uh, topical nowadays. Bishop g5 though, I'm gonna castle. Now, if he plays bishop e2, we transpose into a variation uh, called uh, the Averbach. But it just seems uh, to me that my opponent pretty much wants to do something like bishop h6 and then push the h pawn down the board because these two moves are uh, connected. Generally, as a rule of thumb, when you are playing the King's Indian and they are playing Bishop G5, the C5 uh, break works a little bit better. I know you guys are used to mainly playing E5, but even playing E5 um, in the very position that you see can get you in trouble quickly after D, E, and then Queen D8. Because the issue is that with the Bishop on G5, there is such an annoying pin onto the Rook that they can immediately play something like, uh, well, either knight e5 or bishop f6 followed by knight e5 and notice that uh, you have no way to defend both f6 and c7 so many guys just resign like that so don't do that and remember on bishop g5 usually the c5 break uh, works better just the bishop is kind of not in the center meaning that uh, we can strike it from the other way and after d5 Typical idea is to go for uh, e6, ed5, and then rook e8. Uh, pretty much uh, playing a structure which is the so-called Benoni. Okay, now, in general, whenever you hear the word uh, Benoni, that is a red flag. It's pretty dubious. But the trick in the King's Indian is that in order to like fully master this opening, you need to kind of uh, realize when you can get a good version of the Benoni. Okay, I get it. It's the first time you hear what Benoni is. How are you going to find out when is the good version of it? Or how are you even going to play the good version? Well, I'm going to try to show you here. Because we're going to go ED and then rook e8. So, huh, he plays bishop g7. Okay, we're not going to talk about it. I think it's just a normal move. I'm just going to take. But the point that I'm trying to make, generally, okay, you can take this small note. If white plays bishop g5, uh... You can break with c5, you get the good Benoni. Now, the thing with the Benoni, not to leave you hanging, is that um, the biggest problem when you are playing like this, um, let's say to give like a standard uh, context for Benoni, let's say you play uh, the modern Benoni, 
something like this, d6, uh, e4, g6. Well, white has a lot of uh, very annoying lines, such as, let's say, and the four pawns to play f4 in the center, and then bishop g7, then he can play uh, bishop b5 check, is very annoying, and uh, this is super scary. So, here, when they go bishop g5, essentially, we know they're gonna get none of that, so we can just enter the Benoni, because we managed to avoid pretty much all the scary Benoni lines, theoretically speaking. Um, the game went on, we entered this position and uh, he took with the e pawn, keeping it symmetrical. Uh, sometimes this is interesting for white, especially when you don't have a good square to develop the bishop. But I don't think it should be a problem here, as uh, yeah, we already have a check and it feels like uh, white is a little underdeveloped. It's more typical that they play cd5 and then you have rook e8, putting pressure on the pawn immediately. And um, let's say in case he would have uh, gone something like maybe bishop d3, uh, you can play something like knight bd7. And the typical idea after something like knight f3, you can go pawn to c4, which is a typical uh, sacrifice in the Benoni. If they take, the point is e4 is undefended. And if they slide the bishop back, the point is now you have a good square for the knight and play knight c5 with tremendous pressure on e4. Now, because he played ED, I'm just going to go for the check and he's going to have to block somehow. Okay, no matter how he blocks, it's going to be a bit of an uh, uncomfortable position for my opponent. And I am expecting bishop e2 just because knight e2 kind of blocks the bishop forever. And then the question is, do we have one of those uh, very weird but very strong moves for this uh, pawn structure? which is uh, playing b5 kind of like out of nowhere, okay? Uh, I mean, b5, what on earth is this? Uh, I get it. That is my reaction too. And it's kind of hard to uh, sort of tell uh, when this is good. Well, first things first, the idea with something like b5, let's say, is that you can play like a Benko Gambit, okay? Like bishop e2 on the board. And if they take a6, if pawn takes on a6, bishop takes... He can immediately lose uh, because of the pressure along the e-file. So, from that point of view, all is good and clear. But we need to come up with something on knight takes on b5. And uh, I don't really see something clear. I mean, there is knight e4 that we could throw in. But then, can we actually follow this up somehow? I feel like this should be good because any move like queen c2 can possibly uh, be met not only by check but also by bishop f5, developing with tempo and threatening knight g3, which just makes me think uh, we get a lot of compensation. So I think b5 is one of those uh, typical moves that it's easy to miss if you have never seen it before. So uh, you can think me later for that. Uh, I mean, <laughs> think me later, not think me later. That was pretty stupid, okay? You're watching for the chess, not for the English. Okay, b3 on the board, instantly. Opponent uh, giving zero Fs, but um, you should have definitely spent a little bit of uh, time there, for sure. Now I can go b4, knight moves, knight e4. That's a thing. But I can also try to play for bc and then soften the pawn so that uh, I can play bishop a6. And I'm creating a threat to take because uh, of the pin. So if that happens... Yeah, I just think this should be pretty good. He has to ma make a king move, but I think uh, there is still uh, like sort of a long-term target on c4 that we can keep uh, attacking. And uh, this just looks uh, very promising already after the critical b5 move, which uh, we're going to check after the game uh, what would have happened if you would have taken it with a knight. I'm sure that is what most of you are wondering, but um, my intuition uh, and uh, the fact that I spent uh, 10 years having no life and playing this game tells me that um, we had pretty decent compensation. So uh, this huge threat, so maybe he could think of maybe like knight f3 trying to... Simply bail out, castle, give up the pawn, and it is what it is. But he 
replace queen to d3 instead, which uh, it is indeed uh, the most common move. Like knight d7 would be most natural by far. And then like knight e5, knight e5, rook e5, he castles, we play like queen a5, fine. But I kind of want to start with it right away, just because I have idea to play queen b4 too. Like, you know, doubling down uh, on that threat. Yeah, it's just whether we want to have uh, 94 rook c1 uh, on the board or not. That is pretty much like the biggest thing. But what is actually important to notice, and um, I think we're going to get to that position uh, soon. I mean, we actually don't because he didn't play knight f3. But I wanted to mention that in this position in the end game, it's very important to understand that, uh, okay, we have uh, pressure because he has same, uh, I mean, pawns on the same color as their own bishop. So their own bishop is bad, while my bishop is good because pawns are on the opposite color of the bishop. Now after f3, this uh, stops knight e4 but creates uh, a weak square and after knight e7, there is really no way to stop knight e5. So I think he suddenly is collapsing with knight x on c4 to happen on the next move, pretty much hitting him like a train in full speed. Okay, it's just uh, like one of those punches that uh, <laughs> you don't really see it coming. So, uh, yeah, it's like uh, you're having a normal talk with your wife and first thing that uh, she doesn't like instantly hits you with the <laughs> uh, magical fist. You don't even see it and then, uh, yeah, you know, uh, you know the rest. So, uh, castle, just gonna go knight c4. This is a pin, uh, there is knight e3, there it goes. We got the fork, it's not like really he could have uh, done much to stop it. Now it's just time to uh, kind of uh, cash in the uh, very sound positional play that uh, we uh, yeah, implemented so far throughout this game. Honestly, I'm pretty happy about uh, the way this turned out. Because it just looks like such a dull structure, like what could you even possibly invent or talk about, you know? But just because there were so many little details uh, after this B5 idea, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it just goes to show how such a simple opening, you play it as white, you think there's no way you could possibly lose because of the symmetrical structure. Well, you saw how easy it was to lose. Okay, you just play b5 and all of a sudden uh, your opponent's pieces activate and uh, start uh, knocking at your door to the point where I can just get away with a move such as rook e2. Just look at this rook. I can do this because the queen is pinned so he cannot take and the rook is like literally chilling in his backyard, uh, you know, hanging out uh, with the uh, Nintendo playing Legends of Zelda. He just uh, doesn't really care. The queen has to move, almost lose the knight uh, next too. So, um, yeah, okay, queen back, I can even uh, bring uh, the rook, I can try to keep rook e3, maybe double attack. Uh, look also for the uh, discovery. Uh, you remember that channel uh, you never like to watch? Oh, I have just blundered. I forgot that my rook was in a completely mine square. I got a little bit uh, caught in the story there, but luckily, Position was so winning, we're still having an extra exchange. So, you know what? I didn't blunder. That was actually a sacrifice to make the position a little bit easier to convert. Well, now I'll have to speed up a little bit because there is not a lot of time left. So, <laughs> I'm going to prepare uh, the move queen b2, just infiltrating. Trying to yet again uh, knock at his door. Turns out uh, we started playing Legends of Zelda a little bit too soon before finishing this game. So, uh, yeah, now I just, you know, I want to play queen c1. I want to uh, deliver a, a checkmate if possible, if that's not too much to ask for, really. Uh, okay, opponent goes 94, which I'm going to take. And in case of 94, I can play f5. I can also check, like he could take with a pawn trying to minimize the damage, but then I can uh, turn around the other side. So yeah, this is pretty instructive because f5 wins by force. I think, if I'm not like blundering heavily again. So, I'm gonna check first, just so I don't give him knight c3, knight d1 idea. And then I wanna push f5. So when knight d6 happens, I have checkmate and uh, he has to like, I don't know, 
He has to go queen c3. Yeah, like to get rid of the queens. But uh, with 30 seconds on the clock, this should be um, easy to win. But shout out to my opponent. He's doing a good job in uh, not losing immediately. Like um, he just has to uh, go for the best play, not to get made it immediately. A lot of people just uh, collapse and uh, you can really take advantage of uh, time situation of your opponent when there is no increment. Uh, it's not like it's something unethical or something. You should definitely go for it if it's possible. Uh, so, yeah, just uh, going to pick up these pawns. Obviously, uh, I won't be able to explain every little single thing because, uh, yeah, I have to... Speed up, but uh, the conversion will be rather intuitive. Yeah, I saw he's going to take that pawn, but I'm taking another one. I'm going to go rook g2, targeting this. The king is going to be close to uh, pretty much keep his d pawn under control. I'm going to go here, king e4 check, and then pick up that. Um, yeah. Pick up the g pawn, king f8 on check. Now we have simple conversion, just because uh, king is next to the pawn and uh, we're able to place ourselves in front. <laughs> and then going to be uh, collecting with the other bad boys. That's our, uh, just imagine just being these kind of pawns, you know? <laughs> Do you guys know those uh, kind of uh, people that are lifeguards at the uh, swimming uh, Olympics? These are the pawns, like all the game, not doing anything. But <laughs> all of a sudden, move 50, time to wake up. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Okay, I'm going to go g5. So, whether he takes or not, I have to, like, pre-move it. Yeah, that's a queen. So the easiest technique now, uh, it's actually something that uh, I also presented in the uh, Silman book that I uh, covered on Endgames. You want to get two queens, um, or queen and rook, and then you want to go for something called the ladder checkmate. Meaning, uh, with every single move that we play, we'll try to cut away uh, some files of our opponent. Okay, he's going to let me do three queens, I mean. I'm going to give him a queen for fun, just so we can show the ladder mate. Okay, I'm going to give away uh, one queen. And then uh, I'm going to show uh, the ladder mate. So the point is, you want to choose a side. And uh, I'm going to choose this side. You want to place your queens like this. And then uh, I'm just going to bring them over like here. Yeah, like one by one. Controlling those squares. And now uh, look how easy it is. So we, we control that. We have check. And then uh, we have this. Yet again. Controlling this side. Has to go there. I'm gonna pre-move, controlling that that side, and um, now it's easy. He resigns because uh, there was this move. So you also learn how to ladder mate. Look at you, learning so fast. Now, besides the fact that I hang the rook, I actually sacrificed. I think it was very interesting uh, to have a look onto this b5 move. Let me tap myself on the back for that, okay? I haven't uh, wasted 10 years. It's actually been 13 years of my life by now. I started playing just when I was 10, more seriously. I learned the rules at the age of four, but uh, yeah, there is that. <laughs> Fun trivia about me. But yeah, B5. Actually kind of a nice move. Because CB, you play in Volga Gambit kind of style. And to show you what I mean, uh, Volga Gambit uh, starts with the moves uh, C5, D5, and then B5. And the point in Volga Gambit is to give away this pawn, and then you fiank your own. And you pretty much play for these two open files as compensation. So, in order to be like a, sort of a complete King's Indian player, you have to figure it out uh, when you have to, let's say, transpose to Benoni, transpose to Volga Gambit, like good version, or Benko Gambit, it's the same. And when to play e5. These are pretty much the main things um, that make this kind of uh, difficult learning curve for beginners if you want to play it properly. But uh, little by little, I think it's manageable. Here you see b5, which is like a very advanced idea. Okay, like... Uh, 2200 uh, me probably didn't know about this idea, but uh, well, it's sort of modern theory and uh, it became even uh, 
common for some uh, lines and the idea is that knight b5 I had this and after queen c2 I didn't really see a good uh, square for the queen and I notice I can even check so playing a position like this even down a pawn with his king being so vulnerable I mean it felt like uh, just amazing you know he cannot play g4 just take there's a pin so um yeah apparently b5 was perfectly timed and uh it's very important that cb5 a6 it goes to show that this is devastating because a careless move like knight f3 can just lose the game on the spot after something like knight e4 i think just notice there is literally no way in defending that poor bishop I mean, technically speaking, he could go knight g1, but queen e7, come on, are you really gonna ever get away with such a bishop? Imagine you try to unpin and there is rook d4. How about that? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, with that being said, I think pretty much you get a good idea of uh, why b5 was so effective. Just because kind of, if you don't do b5, you just have to play maybe sort of like a knight d7, knight f8 type of game, bishop d7, and sort of wait, you know, just like trade pieces on the e-file and uh, hope for a draw. But hopefully this goes to show you uh, the dynamic potential behind the king's Indian, even in such a uh, flat looking position. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much it about this game. Just, uh, <laughs> rookie three was a bit funny. Rookie three was uh, unnecessary. I should have just, uh, yeah, played it simple. I forgot his queen can move uh, backwards. <laughs> that was pretty, uh, uh, that was pretty strange. Uh, I can just do this and, um, yeah. Anything else pretty much, but, um, just even after rookie three position is so unbelievably winning, it's still plus four. Because <laughs> I also took his rook and uh, we just traded. So, uh, yeah, I think with that being said, uh, we can just move on to the following game. All right, boys and girls, getting another black game. Gonna be going for the King's Indian defense. And uh, because this is gonna be a video for the black pieces, I am wearing a black outfit. Pretty ingenious, I know. Gonna be going for the King's Indian. And my opponent seems to be playing very standard so far d4 c4 knight c3 it is simply preparing the move e4 i'm just gonna play the king's indian move which is completing the fianchero and my opponent has a choice big choice he decides to play one of the most common variations now additionally uh, your opponents may also do stuff like the knight out combined with the bishop move to g5 or f4 which is something that uh, we're going to be uh, discussing about on the channel. If not in this video, definitely in the future. E4, you can castle or play D6. I'm just going to go D6, uh, kind of keeping things uh, very simple. Castle is not a mistake. It will most likely transpose, but I want to keep it simple. <laughs> so I'm going to play D6, instantly making E5 uh, dubious. Uh, just because uh, we could have taken queen d1, trade queens, play something like knight g4 uh, or knight d7, and the enemy pawn on e5 is going to be very weak. And my opponent plays uh, h3, which is actually an interesting line. I'm going to go castle, and then it's going to be uh, interesting uh, to see what he's going to play, because it's mainly between knight f3 or bishop e3. On bishop to e3, this is now uh, a little bit uh, of a funny position because uh, white is kind of uh, staying uh, super flexible. And uh, in a lot of positions, uh, he may be willing to just go, let's say, e5, d5, and then just go g4. And he's not rushing to develop the knight to f3 because he wants to have uh, the opportunity of playing knight e2, knight g3. I think here I'm going to stick with the uh, simplest move. I'm just going to be striking in the center. Additionally, something that becomes uh, quite meta nowadays at the top level, it's a5. It's a bit of a strange move, but it's useful in uh, a lot of variations. I'm going to go e5. Myself, I played knight bd7 uh, in all over the board uh, game quite a while back. 
But I'm gonna stick with the easiest uh, move for you. Because this is pretty much forcing him to make a decision either to push or to take. I'm saying that uh, because I think I believe uh, knight f3 allows ed, knight d4, rook e8, f3, and then knight h5. And black is already better. And if I think about it, I think I even had that in a tournament game some 10 years ago. <laughs> I'm 23, so I I'm pretty old. No, I'm kidding. But I I've been playing just for a while, so uh, I have uh, <laughs> a sign of a wasted life. Now, D5. Definitely because uh, we were threatening to take uh, and play Rook 8, and there's no convenient way in defending. Where I'm going to be playing the move pawn to A5. To a lot of the new viewers, this is going to look like horrendous. Why would you uh, waste a move on playing A5? You know, just uh, instead of developing pieces, you're moving pawns aimlessly. Well, this is a bit of a prophylactic move. It's preparing our development. We're preparing to get a pony onto c5, so that my opponent is going to have no way to get rid of it. Like, imagine you just started playing knight e6, knight c5 right away. Well, there's quite a big chance that sooner or later your opponent would simply try to get rid of it by pushing b4, targeting your horse. So, from that regard, a5 makes a lot of sense. And I'm gonna go knight e6, preparing knight c5. My opponent plays bishop to e2. I have to say, uh, he's starting uh, to do some questionable moves, but a3 is pretty tricky. I don't think bishop e2 is necessarily a mistake, but it's also not the... Uh, most common move. Like, as I uh, as I said, uh, he could play uh, here something like knight e2 with the idea to play g4, knight g3, uh, set up like queen d2. But he's going bishop to e2 instead, taking away the opportunity of playing knight e2, which kind of makes this bishop e3 setup uh, not so logical. Uh, as I explained earlier, uh, if you want to play knight f3, you just do it right away. The point of bishop e3 move order is to go g4 and then uh, bring this knight towards g3. I hope that is very clear for uh, everybody. Uh, I know these little nuances may be a little bit uh, confusing at first, but uh, yeah, if you just, uh, let's say, take a minute, pause there and think about it, it's pretty intuitive. Now, a3 is a pretty tricky move because uh, it's setting up a very annoying trap. Okay? If we just play... Uh, Something like uh, knight d7, knight c5, which is the standard plan. He really wants to uh, get in b4. Because after a, b, a, b, we cannot take with a knight since the rook is going to be undefended. So uh, that is pretty tricky, I have to say. So I'm considering knight c5 and... Uh, this is just not an easy move to deal with at all. And taking may actually happen just because he doesn't have many convenient ways to defend. Like, sure, queen c2 would be, I think, the simplest and the best. Defending the pawn, I think after queen c2, we can pretty much uh, continue with uh, something like maybe bishop d7, idea to play a4. But somehow I have a feeling he's gonna give up the precious bishop, which is like a huge mistake in this structure. He's just going to be completely vulnerable on the dark squares uh, after that. Uh, also, f3 defending is not good because that allows knight h5. And notice how all these dark squares are vulnerable. There is knight f4. Uh, we can also activate this bishop. So that doesn't help. Bishop d3, whenever it happens, immediately snipe the bishop. Um, taking any of white's bishops is very important in the king's Indian. Despite it looks like a closed position, and uh, you may be tempted to think that bishops are not uh, very useful in closed positions, they kind of are. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm just gonna make it simple. It sounds weird, but uh, sooner or later, the position will open up and the bishops will matter. So, opponent plays f3, playing uh, something that we already mentioned. It's questionable because of this. Actually, there is not an easy way to uh, defend against knight g3. And uh, yeah, if bishop f2, trying to stop that. Um, there's many moves. Knight f4, b3, 
pretty tempting, but Bishop F1... I was actually about to say this is a huge mistake. Now, I guess it is just uh, your turn to pause the video and find out why King to F2 is a horrendous move. Because you can play my favorite King's Indian move, okay? Uh, I'm even like the kind of guy who would play this move even when it's bad. Because it's just like so satisfying. This is my favorite move of all time in chess. And especially it happens in the King's Indian. You play Queen H4. You just like, bang! You know, you, you literally take the Queen and you could, you could throw it on the board. You don't even have to adjust the piece. Uh, I have it already like such a mechanism. I, I need to do these. It's just, you know, muscle memory. I just do these and the Queen immediately lands on H4. It is just so brutal and usually it just leads to mate when you do that in the King's Indian. Because the only move that he can play really is King F1. Or I guess the pawn. <laughs> but against both, we could do uh, knight takes on g3. They're just like a massive discovery. We're going to be winning the rook and uh, pretty much the house. Okay, he goes there. Now, this is not an easy move, but it's pretty much just uh, kind of putting the cherry on top of the cake. So may I ask you to pause the video again and try to actually be precise. Okay, because there's a very uh, big risk in these type of situations that you notice like a convenient move and uh, you're not taking full advantage of the situation. And then perhaps uh, it even backfires. So I'm saying this is specifically difficult because it's a retreating move. It is knight f5 check, pretty much saying the king has to leave, meaning that the bishop is going to be uh, hanging. And oh man, not only that is going to be hanging, but he's also going to be winning the enemy queen. <laughs> because no matter where he goes, those were the only squares. Now knight takes on e3, just comes with a beautiful fork. Winning the house and uh, finally <laughs> we're going to be uh, playing the main uh, pawn break in the king's Indian. F5. With a huge attack, obviously it helps that we are having the extra queen, but... Uh, Definitely, it goes uh, to show how terribly weakening the dark squares could uh, backfire for my opponent. Now he plays knight b5, looking for, uh, let's say, uh, a little bit of counterplay. I'm going to show you a typical move to always defend the square in the king's Indian. Rook f7. Okay, sure, you can lose that pawn and still be winning. But you don't really need to give your opponent anything. You know, you give him a little bit of something, then he becomes, uh, uh, let's say... Uh, he starts getting uh, some hopes, you know, it's like you, you give him mixed signals. You ever talk with a girl and you feel like uh, things are going good and uh, you start pushing even more and then uh, you just get a cold answer? You don't want to be doing that in chess, okay? Because when they push for more, they usually mate us or we lose or something bad happens. So, all right, I'm just uh, pretty much now in a position where... Because we have the extra queen, uh, we can just look for simplifications. I'm going to start trading pieces. Uh, sure, we could try to finish this game kind of in like full speed, but I just want you to uh, constantly be in the mindset of keeping things simple whenever you have extra material. Trade the pieces, okay? You don't need to be like an amazing calculator to convert such things. Just keep it simple. Try not to give away uh, too much counterplay and also stay away from mixed signals. Bring your pieces into the game, attack uh, your opponent's uh, weak pawns. You can uh, pretty much figure out this is a weak pawn because it cannot be protected by other pawns. So uh, it means it's pretty convenient uh, to attack and uh, also try to maximize your pieces. Yeah, like my bishop not doing much. I'm going to try to activate my bishop with a move like this. Now the bishop uh, can suddenly uh, do something and more so exchange some of my opponent's pieces. To save you the pain, I'll just fast forward the next couple of moves because the position is completely winning and we'll simply catch up with the analysis.
Now, a quick thing to clarify, because I realized I sort of left you hanging there on uh, bishop takes on c5. Uh, there are pretty much two main ideas that you want to be aware of, okay? Something very simple and very solid, straightforward idea that you want to remember about this pawn structure. Okay, you need to notice that uh, there is potentially a dangerous pass pawn. And in general, in chess, the best blockading pieces are the knights. Therefore... This knight can reroute itself to d6 and then break with f5, um, kind of killing two birds uh, with one stone. Also getting the typical uh, king's Indian play, while also stopping the enemy dangerous uh, pawn potentially. However, if you feel a little bit uh, frisky, I also wanted to mention that there is an idea that, uh, okay, sometimes it can be a little bit uh, more risky, but also more rewarding. Uh, that uh, you can sort of delay uh, knight uh, to d6 and many people will be completely shocked when you're using an idea like rook to a6 genuinely getting the uh, longest possible rook lift so these are pretty much uh, the key concepts that I wanted to show you in case my opponent would have taken the knight which in general is a pretty dubious strategical decision for white because uh, the dark squares are going to be uh, weakened for the rest of the game. And the last thing uh, in the game, if he would have defended better, other than king to f2, trying to stop uh, knight g3 by playing the bishop, uh, you could simply play the typical king's Indian move. And imagine he does nothing, right? Like playing b3. You already have a threat of going uh, fe, fe, rook takes on f2, sacrifice the exchange, uh, Run that queen to h4, pretty much throw it like uh, you're playing darts but with a queen. And I'm telling you, <laughs> you may even accidentally hit the bullseye. Because if king e3, well, you may have very well uh, gotten the jackpot because that is a mating one. Um, and obviously white is losing in every single other variation. So hopefully uh, that just uh, goes to highlight the uh, importance of the uh, dart squares in the king's Indian. And... Uh, why you should be constantly uh, looking for ways to take advantage of them with this uh, knight h5, knight f4 uh, type of maneuver. So, with that being said, I think we can move on to the last game of the video, where I'm going to be showing you how to absolutely demolish one of my favorite openings, the London system. All right, boys and girls, getting another black game. going to be uh, going for the King's Indian, and there we go. My opponent plays uh, the little London opening. I'm going to be uh, playing the King's Indian. And what is actually so nice about the King's Indian is that uh, against uh, how most of the people uh, tend to play the London system, this is one of the best uh, counters that you could possibly go for. And I want you to start uh, with a simple and uh, typical fianchero get castled, and play d6. After that, I'm going to show you the uh, sort of magic uh, recipe, if you want to call it uh, that. Okay, he plays c4. I'm going to go d6. It's pretty weird that uh, he plays c4. Most of the London guys like to uh, set up the pawn pyramid and then play uh, knight d2, bishop d3. I guess this one is a little bit special. I'm gonna go uh, for d6, nevertheless, and uh, okay, he plays h3, mm, very logical, so that on knight h5 he has bishop back, and I'm gonna play knight bd7, okay, it's important to like, uh, let's say have patience when it comes to developing the light squared bishop, because a move such as this is not really uh, that amazing in general, because if you follow that up with knight bd7, your bishop on f5 could easily become a target to even knight h4 ideas, just to give an example. So it's even better to start with the knight, and the bishop will uh, most often uh, find, uh, let's say, a lucrative career onto the long uh, diagonal after playing b6, bishop b7, which we can start with. Additionally, you can consider this uh, rook e8, e5 idea and delay development of the bishop. However, I kind of like uh, to start with b6. I don't think d5 is uh, quite in time. Uh, perhaps because of an e5 type of move, I think that is pretty well-timed. 
D5 has the idea to, uh, let's say, uh, meet bishop b7 with knight d4. And it's not like really a disaster, but uh, white is getting a little bit of control in the center. But I think uh, if we uh, would have uh, answered that with e5, after d, e, f, e, let's say knight e4, you could maybe play a move like knight c5 and uh, be very comfortable. So yeah, he does none of that. We get a pretty harmonious setup. And I'm expecting him to castle. Castle short, very standard, very typical for the straighting range. By the way, in my opinion, playing bishop to d3 is a little bit unnecessary for white. I think just in general for any kind of London player that is looking for advice while facing the king's Indian, I think it's better to place this bishop on e2. Just kind of for prophylactic measures since it's not like you will ever use this bishop for an attack. Okay, it's just like completely restricted over that diagonal. And uh, considering the fact that black is normally aiming to break with e5, the bishop can only become a target to this fork. Now, in this position, you have uh, two ways of playing it. Normally, I am in love with this queen e8 idea, preparing e5. But specifically, because he has a knight on c3, if I'm starting queen e8, knight to b5 is a little bit annoying. Like, for instance, rook c8, uh, the pawn drops on a7. So that is simply not uh, not great. Now the question is, do I have time for a6 followed by queen e8 and then e5? And then perhaps uh, move the knight away, go f5? Or should I play rook e8? Let's say he goes bishop h2, e5. I'm assuming he moves the bishop or takes or does something. And then we can play e4. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'm just gonna go for uh, rook to e8. It just feels uh, a bit slow to play e6 and then queen e8, so I'm gonna switch to another very typical move, preparing this, and um, yeah. White will uh, have to be very careful not to lose the piece immediately, okay? You have no idea how many, uh, just countless times, uh, the white players are just uh, kind of... Mm. just having a blind spot to this idea, I guess, like rook c1 and now after e5, they need to find bishop g5, okay? I think not even that is helping, to be honest. I think we just won a piece. Now that I'm looking at the position more carefully, he's trying that with the idea that, uh, you know, he's trying to use the pin in case of e4, but also the bishop is covering that. So e4, voila, there you go. This is why I'm saying <laughs> d3 square for the bishop is just uh, not ideal for white in the London. And uh, here you get to see how by using the most basic idea possible in the King's Indian, you can just get a win. And it's not like my opponent did something uncommonly stupid, okay? It's not like we are just getting this for the sake of the video. You have no idea how many players I coached from White's perspective, yeah, like London system players, and this is the tip, the most typical mistake that I would normally see. Like they just developed the bishop to d3 regardless. They don't look, uh, okay, did my opponent play the fianchero? Is my bishop gonna be very active? What is he trying to do? And as soon as they realize it's too late, because look at it, e5 comes with a tempo. You pretty much have no way to react against this, E5 happens, uh, it's already, the game was lost. It's just kind of tough, I guess, to see it in advance uh, for the first time. That uh, black is threatening to win on the spot. So, yeah, after E4, he decided to take it with a bishop. Do not make the mistake to hang the queen. Just take with your own bishop and then capture with a rook. Uh, we're gonna have uh, just a free piece for a pawn, but it's not really even remotely close to give my opponent any compensation. Needless to say though, you shouldn't relax. Like uh, if you just got in the trap, you win the piece and then you like uh, completely uh, shut your brain off. That is the way to lose. But um, let's see if you keep a uh, reasonable level of focus uh, and uh, try to 
prioritize uh, exchanges. Should be having a very easy time converting this. I'm just gonna go h6. Targeting the bishop, I wanna see what he wants to do. Mm. Next up, we could consider a move like c6, just because he's trying to uh, restrict my bishop. I could be playing that. Um, maybe going e4. That's, uh, you know, quite possible, uh, I would say. This is quite an interesting position to convert uh, because uh, I guess most of the people would be a little bit confused just because there are not many open files. So I see my opponent kind of wants to expand. I see also an interesting idea maybe to undermine with b5. Um, g5 is usually pretty risky. I'll try to stay away uh, from playing it. Uh, although I have to say uh, the pin is a little bit annoying. So I'm going to start with a6, just sort of as a flexible move, uh, making sure we stop knight b5. Like imagine we can play queen e7 without having to worry about such an annoying move. And um, yeah, who knows, maybe if we get like a good opportunity to play b5 uh, and win the d5 pawn in return, uh, we'll just sort of keep that on the agenda. But uh, for now, just making uh, a useful move. I guess next I could try to uh, unpin. So hide the queen uh, to f8. And uh, after that, try to get maybe knight c5, knight e4. If we can trade both knights like that, that would just make uh, our game uh, way uh, simpler. Pretty much the conversion will be supernatural since that point. Also, in order to stop it, white needs to be a bit careful. So, uh, yeah, like for instance, now rook e1 has to be played ultra deep move. So that on queen f8, there is f3. Or like, uh, I don't know, uh, knight c5. He plays queen c2. But that's already too late because we get to jump with a knight. So, yeah, like rook e1, queen f8, f3, knight c5, queen c2. It just feels like there should be something very juicy. I don't know what it is, but uh, there's no way he'll ever uh, play this F3 move. It just looks kind of weakening. Uh, no rookie one. I don't find it uh, common for this level. If I had to guess, uh, okay, he plays queen F3. Not sure I would have really guessed that one. But how do we play against it? Queen to f3, not that bad. It's kind of countering my idea in a way that if queen f8, I cannot play knight c5 because then the knight hangs. But I'm going to do queen f8 anyways, you know, just unpinning. So that's kind of a nice thing. Also notice how the queen on f8 is way better placed uh, than on d8. Not only because it's avoiding the pin, but also because the rooks are connected. So uh, this is just an amazing coordination thing. Let's say you can bring your pieces much easier, like rook e5, uh, rook e8, let's say, if you want to double up. But okay, he just played e4. Now I got a tempo move. But the thing with this kind of tempo moves, if you're getting too excited, you may be running the risk of misplacing uh, your pieces. Uh, by not being careful. Like imagine he just plays queen e2 and then f4 comes with a tempo and then maybe e5 comes with a tempo and one active moves can give, let's say, your opponent three active moves later on. So you don't want to be rushing with such things. Okay, as long as a move like 95, high dopamine move, doesn't give you anything concrete, try to think twice before making it. So. I could double up, just improve my position. I am pinning my rook, but it doesn't seem to be a problem. I can go g5, I'm pinning, if I want to proceed with the knight c5 idea. Also, I noticed that my bishop is a little bit out of the game. So, yeah, with that being said, uh, I can also play king to h7, which is quite a nice move. I, I want to show you something pretty uh, pretty funny. It's a little bit of a deep idea, but I think it can be highly instructive because I can go even further with the uh, improvement of the queen. So I could go all the way to a8, which is, uh, you know, a little bit weird, but uh, I mean, the queen could really deal some damage onto this diagonal. Uh, in some openings, this idea is quite common. For instance, uh, I would say in the accelerated dragon or the Marochi structure, 
uh, at some point because there is little space. Black has this plan of uh, going king h7, getting the queen behind, and all of a sudden there could be interesting tactics. Uh, not really immediately, though. So that's a thing. Now, for the next part, I could do rook f8, rook uh, e8. Bring uh, the rooks uh, like that. I could also do rook e7, rook e8. I could also do knight e5 and then g5. Knight g6. The thing with g5 is that it allows a check, so this is better to start with. Oh, sorry, my alarm. Uh, I have to shut that down. It's pretty annoying. <laughs> uh, now, the thing with this move is that queen f4 runs into knight e3. Big fork. And uh, yeah, I'm expecting him to go to e2 or d1. These are pretty much the main candidate moves. Queen d1 immediately fails to knight e3, so kind of by elimination it's e2 or e3. But no matter where it is, I'm gonna go g5. Trying to, let's say, make a little bit of progress. Also uh, sort of stopping him from uh, expanding with uh, f4 which is quite important. I think it's better to eat here because, uh, yeah, it will still keep h5 square under control. Like, for instance, queen e3, g5, uh, bishop g3, knight h5 is pretty nice, yeah, as I'm going to show it on the board. Uh, getting a tempo move. So, yeah, bishop sack doesn't work. Now, this is great. If his queen was on e2 blocking that, I would have gone uh, knight d7 instead. And then, uh, well, if f4 would take... Uh, we would have taken like that, and uh, if not, I would have probably looked uh, for maybe this, rook f8, rook e8, and eventually f5. Just kind of slow uh, build up, just no need to rush with the extra piece, okay, just try to make small improvements in your position, and uh, not only that, uh, it's going to become more obvious uh, how to find the winning plan, but you're giving uh, your opponent uh, a lot more chances to make mistakes. So, in general, they will just uh, lose their patience, especially down a piece. They will play much worse. They will get, like, demoralized. It is very common. So, um, yeah, just uh, keep the game going and should be good. He's doing that. I'm going to activate. If G3, that's hanging pawn. Also, I could go back. Um, also, maybe there is tactics. He needs to watch out for tactics sometimes. Don't don't forget about the queen that's uh, doing a lot of damage on the diagonal. Mm. The only piece that it's not really amazing is the bishop on uh, b7. Like, let's say that, if I could bring it to d7, not to block the rooks, it would be even more active. That would be uh, pretty juicy. And then... Um, I was uh, thinking uh, rooks can come like this, so we can eventually break with f5. But he plays rook e3. Now, immediately, I'm wondering, okay, can we just go bishop d4? He can go back, so... Not clear what uh, we achieve uh, from that. And I think it's just time to bring uh, the rooks like this. So rook f8, so that on g3 there will never be a hanging f pawn. Preparing to bring uh, the rook, and then we're also uh, bringing back the bishop. Simply to not have it staring into the d5 pawn. And even though it kind of looks uh, like a sophisticated game, you want to remember that we have the uh, full extra piece. So this is always in control. I'm just uh, being careful with uh, maneuvering around. So now I have two ways I can do this, and block with a knight, or I can start with a bishop and uh, play the bishop. I won't even let him check. So, yeah. Start with this, bring it to d7, do that. Um, I just think we have such an uh, amazing positional structure, like the queen is sort of, uh, you know, um, kind of guiding around uh, all the pieces, like... Uh, Let's say, uh, you know, I don't really know how that guy is called uh, in, the, in the orchestra. That's, uh, let's say, the boss of the orchestra. It's guiding all the, like, musicians around. 
Hopefully you guys uh, know the name of that. You let me know in the comments. But I feel like this is exactly what the queen is doing. Uh, the queen is a big boss. And uh, yeah, just uh, doing uh, small improvements. I think we can uh, let him uh, take the bishop. I'm going to like activate the queen. Bringing uh, all the pieces. And we'll eventually break with f5. So... Nothing really uh, special there. If he doesn't take on e5, I might be playing f5 regardless. So, uh, yeah, we cannot really keep the bishop. Like, uh, at some point, we have to trade it for something. Like, maybe even takes and then f5 could be interesting. I don't think he has any sacrifice because uh, <laughs> knight move backwards. So, uh, yeah, he's also going down on time. I have to say, this guy, for somebody that has uh, just uh, got caught off guard and lost a piece, he kept decent composure for a 1600 rated player. In general, uh, I expect most of uh, these guys to lose interest pretty quickly and uh, start uh, tilting and blundering more. But he didn't make really any mistakes. He kept pieces on the ball and, uh, I mean... He's still completely lost. It's not like that changes anything. We have the extra piece, but uh, yeah, just giving him a little bit of credit. Can I go for f5? Simple move. Time to open up uh, the lines. That's why uh, we placed our rooks the way we did. And uh, we have the very nice uh, dirigeur on age eight. Is that how it's called? That would be maybe the Romanian version of it. A dirigeur. Maybe not. <laughs> That's maybe just a little bit stupid of me to call it that. Oh boy. Okay, I'm just going to take there. It's a little bit embarrassing that uh, I cannot really uh, recall what the name of uh, that is. Let's say the CEO of the orchestra. Can we call it that? That would be a little bit too corporate, but uh, I think it's fair to call it the CEO. And okay, my opponent flags, we uh, managed to uh, take this game down. Uh, I had an extra piece and an extra pawn with an attack on going, so things were looking pretty juicy. Just remember, key idea, all right? That's how you want to develop your pieces against the London system. Double fianchiero, knights like this, and try to break uh, e5, e4. Now, bonus trap, because you made it this far into the video. Uh, I feel like most people are quite likely to do c3, but I recommend you go d6. And after knight bd2, knight bd7, bishop d3. All right, so they just develop their pieces, set up the pyramid. I think it's even trickier to play queen e8 right away. All right? And there's a very big chance that they may immediately castle. Then you go e5 and congrats, you have uh, already won the game. Because no matter where they go, there's going to be e4 uh, idea. Now, this queen e8 move is even stronger than rook e8. Because rook e8, uh, despite being a decent move, it gives them chance to escape last moment. If they find bishop g5, okay, I mean, you still have good position, but it's not completely winning. Because e4, knight e4, and notice that they take advantage of the pin. So queen e8 is uh, meant to even get rid of that idea. So it's even better. As I explained it in our game, uh, I opted for uh, rook to e8 just because, uh, well, it was uh, <laughs> working uh, anyways because we had uh, bishop support. Plus queen e8, I noticed knight b5 is a little bit annoying. It wasn't simple to get rid of the knight. I had to go back and then he goes knight c3 and... Uh, we get uh, like uh, a little kind of awkward uh, dance, you know, it's like uh, you walk into a stranger on the street and you want to take the same direction. This is something that may happen here. So for that reason, I played rook e8. And yeah, I think pretty much uh, you're set to just destroy most of the London players. I mean, except the ones that own my courses. So with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All the love to the boys who made it this fine to the video. And in case you have missed the first video that I have made uh, on the King's Indian, please feel free to click the one that will uh, appear on the screen. Lots of juicy stuff and uh, ideas. So 
If you're still hungry, I'll see you there.